Thank you, Axioma and James. So um, this presentation will be quite different from the one you've seen uh, just now, uh, because somehow it's kind of focusing on a very specific case study, uh, and one project that we've been carrying on uh, since slightly less than four years now. Uh, but somehow I think, um, hopefully, uh, you will notice that uh, just by looking at this very specific case, uh, somehow we'll try to address um, kind of more global issues that, that um, circle around uh, ideas of like how we um, use technology, uh, how the evolution of technology kind of changes our idea of understanding the territory and the environment, uh, and how by looking at landscape uh, and territorial features uh, and evolved uh, over the course of the last century, and how this is tightly connected to the our deal of politics and nation states. So Italian Limes is a project that started uh, in 2014 as a research project uh, in the end and ended up in an interactive installation. Uh, and what we are interested in looking at uh, was uh, somehow a peculiar territorial condition of Italy as a very kind of uh, uh, defined shape, you know, sort of a country defined by this kind of very evident uh, natural features, which is the Alpine, Alpine range, uh, that since uh, lots of time, especially in cartographic representation, has been visualized uh, as a border. So as a sort of like enclosure, uh, kind of a very um, clear demarcation that separates the Italian peninsula from the rest of the continent. And this is very evident in, especially in 19th century, uh, and early 20th century representation of the country from the north, in which you see the Alps as a sort of a barrier dividing the country from the rest of the continent again. And this focus on the Alpine border uh, of Italy um, was for us uh, particularly interesting because, uh, especially like in contemporary Europe, we've been witnessing sort of radical change in what the border of Italy, the border of uh, uh, the countries of uh, Europe uh, look like um, before and after a particular threshold, which, is, which are the Schengen Agreement in 1995. So basically, we moved from a sort of visual landscape like this one, in which like in the internal border of Europe uh, were always uh, uh, somewhat defined by an architecture, so like a physical uh, threshold, like a physical uh, uh, boundary that you had to cross, in which some sort of rituals were involved, you know, showing a passport, opening your uh, car, and so, so on and so forth, to something like this. So somehow a, a sort of uh, apparently uh, open border in which uh, the sort of line that the maps still is uh, still present, still is visible, on the territory itself is not almost almost invisible. The only thing you you, you can now see when you when you cross a border uh, is this sort of traffic sign that only tells you some sort of difference in regulations, uh, uh, speed limits, uh, or this kind of stuff. But of course, we all know uh, this is not true, in, in at least not not in these simplistic terms. We, we all know this is not true uh, in the last few years in which uh, we've been witnessing uh, like a strengthening in the border again. We've been witnessing uh, the precarious conditions of the Schengen agreements in which we, we all know that now Schengen is just a, a sort of privileged condi conditions that we mostly experience as European citizens, but also like we experience in this particular political moment, uh, something that could like reverse to what was before in, a, in uh, basically overnight. Um, so somehow our interest was uh, trying to understand uh, this relationship between the map and the territory, so the relationship between what was actually seen, uh, viewable, like uh, evident in the land, and what was uh, still, uh, um, let's say, untouched on the maps, and so this line that still divided European countries. And um, specifically, this is kind of very interesting to, to look at these uh, topics uh, in the northern uh, part of Italy, because uh, the South Tyrol region, so the northeastern border of Italy, has been, let's say, a political laboratory of the defini definition of borders uh, since the early 20th century. You all know that some of South Tyrol has be became part of Italy after the First World War, so when Italy won the war, and so kind of occupied this uh, part of the country. B before, somehow, the sovereignty of, of this area, this particular stretch of the border um, was discussed a lot uh, to in order to understand what would have been the perfect line, where this line dividing the Italian state and the Austro-Hungarian Empire should have sit. Uh, this map shows uh, uh, these different uh, conceptions. Uh, the 
take into account the different principles, like ethnical, so ethnographic divisions between different cultures, different populations, uh, linguistic divisions, uh, or for example, the reading of natural features of the landscape. And specifically, uh, around these this, uh, years, uh, the first quarter of the 20th century, this particular idea of a natural border, so the assumptions uh, that the, there was a natural border, like one that was not defined by any kind of uh, cultural or political theories, but some, 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 a border that was naturally there, uh, was the assumption, was the theory that took the most uh, um, uh, strength. And in particular, this natural border, what is the natural border? It's, it's a border, it's a line that coincides uh, with the, a range, like a particular line, uh, so the sort of theoretical and geographical construct, which is the watershed line. So somehow the line that divides uh, the hydrograph hydrographical, um, the river catchments uh, between different parts of the continent. So everything that is on south of the, southern of this line are waters that goes into the Mediterranean. Everything that is northern of this line are waters that goes into the Black Sea or the, or the Baltic Sea. This border that actually, after the First World War, that was, was actually, in fact, uh, defined by this watershed line, uh, provided like a very violent history, in, especially in the year after, uh, during the fascism and after the Second World War, in which there was a very violent and strong uh, enforced the process of naturalization of the German population of the South Tyrol. So, for example, this image that we just found last week uh, in our ongoing research in the military archives of the National Geographic Institute of Italy, uh, shows uh, uh, some statistics about uh, uh, the supposed majority of Italian population in, 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 this, in this land, in this part of the country, after the Second World War, in which the Italian part of the population is represented as a, <coughs> as a guy like with a foothold on the, on the land, on the territory, no? while the people speaking German uh, are represented with a Nazi flag uh, as a sort of like a small-scale uh, representation of a, of a person. So what we did uh, when we started to actually do our, the actual research uh, for this project uh, was to go to these archives that I just mentioned, was to go to the Florence, basically, uh, which is the, where the headquarters of the, the National Geographic Institute of Italy are based since the 1865. Uh, these archives uh, are part of the army. Uh, and they correspond basically to the, um, it's called in Italian, it's called Istituto Geografico Militare, so the Military Geographic Institute. Is that organ of the, of the state that um, since the beginning, since the birth of the national state, um, Italy is an independent country, had the role to trace the border and to measure all the territory, to draw the official maps of the country. And nowadays, it's still the same kind of role, uh, and, and also like as the role to maintain the border, so to keep uh, track of all the possible changes that affect uh, the demarcation of this border. As you can see from these first pictures, uh, the, this, this archive is not like a proper archive, in the sense that it's just a bunch of rooms uh, in a military barracks in the outskirts of Florence, uh, and it's a very unstructured archive. So we, what we started to look at was to understand the history of the border. So since we're not surveyors, we, we are not geographers, we started to look at the history, how this border, how, what the border looked like in official, in official documents, how the border was traced in the first place. Um, so going back to the uh, late 19th century, we looked at the document that the, to the first, for the first time kind of depict the Italian landscape, not, not anymore as a say, as a romantic alpine landscape, but as a, as a part of a sovereign country. So the landscape is something that had to be measured, something that had to be understood in mathematical terms in order to be able to map it and basically find this precise line that cut the Alps in two and to find what, where the border of the country was. So these are images of the, this kind of like very long-term endeavor that the Italian army took between 1870s and the, and the 20s to complete this uh, huge effort of mapping the country. And especially in the Alps, uh, this effort, this endeavor was particularly tough because of the uh, nature of the terrain, because of the difficulty of the, uh, to reach these remote places, and also because there was no, at the time, particular technology to see these places from, uh, from above. So there was not a way of uh, uh, actually being able to precisely map these places. These documents that testify this work are really interesting because they're a bunch of a very, very diverse bunch of documents, from photographs to maps, but mostly they are these kind of sketches, drawings, and diaries of descriptions on how to reach the border. 
So a description of how the border looked like in reality, so how the landscape looked like, how you could recognize this sort of like watershed line in the land, and how you actually could, you could survive on this place long enough in order to be able to measure it. And of course, uh, in these images, it's kind of interesting because uh, uh, they're kind of technical images, so they describe the work that has been done there by the surveyors, but also they, we started to see how the border had to be visualized, how the border is actually, first of all, uh, an architecture, so first of all, an architectural object that is constituted by points that are actually have to be made visible, had to be made constructed artificially in order to be able to see them, measure them, and classify them into documents. But at the same time, these are images from later on. For example, for the, these are like a stunning collection of uh, panoramic uh, images uh, of the French-Italian frontier after the Second World War, in which the frontier got redrawn partly because uh, Italy lost the war in their case, and so had to surrender some part of the country to France. In this case, in these panoramic images, what I think is really interesting is that uh, there is an attempt to, uh, again, record the landscape uh, in natural terms. There is no architecture here, there's no, there's no building, there's nothing. But somehow these lines uh, train the eye of the surveyors to see the border in the natural landscape. So somehow they translate nature into something that is detectable as a border. So it's detectable as a threshold, no? So classify, again, national <laughs> features in a very precise geometrical terms. So somehow it's sort of like making the border evident by, by line. This is the way in which uh, some of the graphical means by which uh, the exchange of land was, uh, was codified into the document. So in this case, Italy lost part of the land. These kind of images, this kind of graphical language became the official document of the border. So these are actually pages that officially describe what the border is. And so the border is, of course, something that is traced on maps, but it's also something that has to be recognized all along the line. Then, of course, there are the maps. In this case, uh, is a particularly beautiful uh, atlas uh, of the Yugoslav and Italian border uh, around the 50s. All the border was uh, uh, represented, visualized uh, as this sort of like segments uh, in which the line is clearly described uh, in the territory across the line, like a couple of kilometers north and south of the line, or east to west of the line, were described in really, really uh, precise topographical terms. And of course, the history of the tracing of the border is a history of, uh, let's say, technological refinement. So somehow, the, it goes along with the history of the increase of accuracy of topography and surveying. So the evolution of technology allowed for more and more accurate registration of the border. And, and in this sense, uh, besides becoming more precise, so besides being able to trace more precise maps, uh, the border becomes uh, more and more a geometrical body. So more and more like a set of numbers, a set of calculations and records, in which the border itself almost becomes invisible, in which it is translated into books that are not anymore maps, but just records of coordinates, basically. And in fact, the late maps of the border, the ones that are still valid nowadays, they were traced in the 70s, regarding, for example, the Austrian-Italian border, completely lost the representation of the terrain. So the border becomes just a very, very simple, line that is just defined by a set of numbers. This, of course, uh, then was, uh, again, like uh, emphasized and uh, pushed to the stream by digital technologies, so the advent of GPS technology, which from the 90s basically enforced and pushed the Italian army to redo all the work they've been doing the past century to measure the country again. So these are images from the archives in which uh, all the different points that were like, like the main uh, points from which the, the territory is measured uh, are again retraced and translated into digital coordinates. And then you see kind of the same work they were doing by hand that uh, now it's been doing by using highly precise GPS uh, instruments. Until this like uh, sort of a last image of this uh, sort of visual history of the representation of the border, uh, satellite images start to appear into the official documentation. And especially it's interesting in this uh, uh, the Slovenian-Italian border is the last one to have <coughs> been officially mapped because of the Slovenian in, uh, um, became like a, an independent country. It's kind of interesting how like a supposedly more precise way of uh, picturing and recording the territory, which is satellite imagery, um, in the early days when there was not possibility of uh, completing like a mosaic uh, of, the, of the country with uh, enough... Uh, um, 
amount of images to remove all the clouds. Uh, somehow in the official maps, uh, we have like an element which, again, like is a cloud that obscure what you should be seeing, obscure like a, a part of the, of the board itself. So this is what, uh, after all this kind of historical exploration, this is what the border looks like nowadays. So if you go to the archives, uh, they kind of keep the official documentation of the border. The border is basically four cabinets. Uh, this is just two of them. Uh, because we, we talk about the border of Italy, but actually there are four different ones. So Italy, France, Italy, Switzerland, Austria, and Slovenia. Each of them is like uh, a bunch of uh, um, paper folders. Uh, these folders uh, are organized in cabinets, and they contain the, uh, very boring documents. Basically, for each point that define this line of the border, there is a, a photograph, a description of how the line, how the landscape looked like in the proximity of this point and the digital coordinates. So just like thousands and thousands of sheets of paper collected in these folders. Going back to the, to the actual place, to the actual territory, what is the border? As we said at the beginning, the border correspond for large segments uh, to this watershed line. Uh, this watershed line, again, is a, is a, is a theoretical construct. It's nothing that exists in nature. It's like a geographical definition. And you, uh, you can think about it as a, as a line that crosses the Alps uh, in a particular point where the waters are divided. And be but because the Alps are um, um, mostly um, high-altitude mountains, uh, this line uh, for Quite a lot segments of the border runs on glaciers. So you can see from this very low resolution Google Earth uh, screen, screenshot, uh, the, the yellow line, this is a view over the Austrian Italian border. And you see clearly in this part. In, in this case, uh, the border sits on top of this mountain and then crosses these glaciers and then again follow a ridge and then cross another glacier and so on. This was also like a true when the border was first determined. So these are like uh, kind of similar images when the the first surveyors tried to define this border and define the watershed where the border was, uh, was traced. And this is what uh, this place uh, looked like uh, nowadays. This image was taken two years ago in the same place you were seeing in the, in the image before. This image was taken late spring when still there was snow, but uh, a similar, uh, this, the same place looks like this over summer. So we all know that because of climate change, alpine glaciers are melting and are reducing their volume a lot. And this somehow in, uh, in the early 2000s became a huge problem for cartographers and surveyors because somehow the military, when they were over summer crossing, like walking along, along the, this border trying to see if there was any broken boundary stone or something that had to be restored, they realized that a lot of the glaciers had moved or retreated, like in this case. You have to imagine this glacier was completely overarching and going above this ridge and this mountain. This border had moved, and so the watershed line was not anymore on top of these glaciers, but was just uh, either completely displaced, uh, coinciding with uh, uh, rocks and ridges instead of ice. These things happened all over the place. So since like the uh, global warming has impacted so much in the Alps, uh, this was like happening in lots of different places of the border. All the maps that were recorded in the, in the archives basically were no more valid. They were not anymore being equal to what was on the, to where the watershed was actually in the land. Uh, so these are one image of the glacier I showed you before in the Google Earth screenshot in which you can see the two different lines, so two different positions of the watershed. And the first one, the dashed red line, was the historical border. So it's the border where it was thought to be from the maps. And the blue dots are the new measure, the new GPS measures uh, that in 2008 the surveyors uh, took in order to see, to determine where the watershed has shifted. So in this case, uh, this, you have to imagine that this glacier kind of moved, uh, changed its geometry, and so the kind of surface uh, changed in height, and so the, the way in which water flows are completely different now. This is like the uh, largest stretch of the Swiss and Austrian border in which we just mapped uh, how recurrent glaciers are. So basically how the border is crossed like lots of glaciers over its path. What happened? It happened that uh, basically the surveyors went to the government and said, look, we need to address this problem because there is like lots of places where uh, when we go there, we have to um, somehow discuss the position of the border with our counterparts, either with Swiss or Austrian. Uh, how can we do that? And because according to diplomatic international law, every time the border moves, so every time, for example, Italy loses part of the territory, uh, has to gain another part of territory from the other country. So in theory, 
neither country should lose or win territory. But since this was like so minute so, and so widespread, it was impossible to map and would have been like a huge uh, cyclopic effort. So in a, in a kind of uh, interesting way, the government came up with a new definition of the border, which is, uh, this is uh, like an excerpt uh, that we translated uh, from the, uh, the discussion in the parliament uh, uh, over the new law of the mobile border, which basically the parliament uh, said that uh, climate change, which at the high altitudes have modified the physical evidence of the boundary lines, uh, this constituted a problem. So as a result of noticing this problem, the Commission of the Maintenance of the Swiss Italian Border has, it, has decided to introduce a new notion of the frontier, the so-called mobile border. So basically, the two countries decided to uh, overcome this problem, well, not, not changing the law, but changing the definition of the border. So since 2008, the border between the countries, the Alpine countries, is defined as, let's say, uh, mobile. So any kind of movement this border makes because of climate change and, and melting glaciers is just acknowledged by the, the mapping institutes. So it's just uh, uh, where the glacier moved and that, that there's about the border. So this brought to uh, like an effort, a new mapping effort. It started from 2008, the military is like walked around the entire border, dropped by helicopters and made new maps of the border. So kind of acknowledge this natural shift of the boundary line. So these are images of this campaign of measurements. It's called like the mobile border campaign. And we just compare these images uh, uh, with some from maybe 100 years or 50 years before that somehow testifies how the differences in the kind of uh, uh, equipment and gears, but somehow also the similarities between uh, these efforts. So somehow this uh, kind of apparently meaningless uh, uh, glitch in international law, which at the, at the beginning we kind of, uh, when they, the military told us this story, this fact, uh, this anecdote, uh, not very surprising, uh, Say, evidence of the awkwardness of the Italian state. You now, why spending so much, so many resources, and why making new laws about the boundary that moves at 4,000 meters on a glacier, with, where nobody really crosses it? Uh, then, after like uh, a, a more in-depth insight, uh, became actually a kind of like pivotal moment where we understood uh, how this kind of really, really strange uh, uh, fact uh, allowed us to talk about a lot of different issues that we're interested in. in. Uh, most of all, mostly about, uh, again, this relationship between the idea of, uh, uh, let's say, the abstract construct of nature, construct of nature, so how uh, these sort of natural features that are supposed to be natural are instead uh, completely political. So the idea that somehow we, we need to make the border evident uh, with a natural feature is, again, politically, it's not something that nature defines because nature moves all the time. It's basically untenable. And also about technology. So this, this um, and interestingly enough, I think uh, the problem of the, of the mobile border is not caused by climate change itself uh, because, okay, climate change kind of makes the border shift very deep, very quickly, but I think it's more caused by the advanced uh, in uh, um, measuring technologies because somehow the, the problem of a mobile border has been caused by the high precision of the instrument by which we were able to see the glacier movement moving, not just the fact that the nature moves, which always happened. So what we did was uh, somehow to try to make this issue evident uh, and try to bring it to the extreme. So somehow trying to exploit this uh, paradoxical situation, uh, trying to uh, makes the visitor of the exhibition for which we are called to do a project uh, sense this movement of the, connect to this glacier, so somehow sense this border moving almost in real time. So we decided to build some measuring devices, <coughs> kind of uh, custom uh, makeshift uh, border sensors. So we put together like a bunch of uh, uh, electronic components, uh, and we came up with this sort of design, which is uh, like a, a bomb basically, sustained by this sort of tripod with the idea of installing these, uh, these sensors on the glacier itself um, in order to be able to somehow sense the moving of the surface, of the melting surface, and be able, um, in this way, to measure where the border was moving. So we built uh, a series of these sensors, 25 of them, and then we decided to again, install them on, the, on one of these glaciers. So we took one of these glaciers, like a stretch of the border, as a sort of uh, example of all these old phenomenon was unfolding in the Alps. So in spring 2016, we, together with some glaciologists and some scientists, we, we went on the border and we installed this, uh, this network. 
So these are images of the expeditions. So it was a team of people we put together. We involved some scientists because uh, we wanted somehow also to, on one hand, uh, uh, we asked them for scientific <laughs> advice, and then also we wanted this uh, effort that we were doing to be able to, to contribute uh, somehow to the knowledge of uh, uh, how climate change is modifying glaciers in the Alps. And also we wanted to they wanted also to test uh, uh, kind of sort of a, even like a very, um, not very scientific way of measuring uh, um, glaciological phenomenon, but some of them were interested in understanding how a potential new system of measurements could, could work for them. Again, like uh, a comparison on <laughs> what this could have been looked like the, a century ago. Uh, and then we installed this uh, network, and so we, we envisioned uh, like a square, like a grid, in which you have to imagine that the border somehow crosses in the middle of this grid. Then. So the idea was to build a sort of a low resolution uh, grid that was able to detect uh, the ridges on the glacier, so somehow being able to detect the topology of this grid. Uh, these diagrams uh, were uh, the way in which we deployed uh, the grid on the glacier. So we divided into teams uh, and we figured out the, the least, uh, uh, the shortest uh, walk that we had to do on the glacier to install this grid. The size of it is roughly one kilometer by one kilometer. And these are the, the sensors in, uh, installed in the glacier. When you try to photograph them from afar, you can re start to realize the scale of it. Even if it is like a relatively small glacier, it's kind of big for the human scale. So it's almost impossible to see the grid uh, in real life because you can just see a couple of points, but not the entirety of it. So this is an image we took uh, uh, with a helicopter when we went away. So these are just, for example, they're not very visible in the picture, but actually that's the position of uh, uh, six uh, of the 25 uh, points that we installed. What this sensor did, this sensor basically were programmed to do a very simple thing. So every hour, send uh, some data over a GSM connection. So they were programmed to send some uh, their coordinates, uh, their position based on uh, pressure measurements, uh, and then some other atmospheric data, but temperature, humidity, light, in order to understand what, what the environment looked like. So this is the interface through which we were receiving all the data through basically SMS. So every sensor was uh, as a SIM card and was transmitting data independently. And then we started to build a machine, some sort of visualization of this data in the exhibition itself. We talked about a drawing machine. Uh, this is like a very early prototype. A drawing machine in the shape of a pantograph uh, on one side because it's a very efficient machine. On the other side, because it kind of reminded us some of the machines we saw in the archives. They were used in the early 20th century for the first time to map the Alps, basically to um, translate the first uh, photographic pictures that were they were taken by planes uh, into maps, into contour lines and maps. So it was sort of like uh, referring to the same technologies, but like updated with digital tools. Uh, and then we also wanted to uh, represent the territory in three dimension, because uh, what I think is really striking when you talk about uh, this kind of very ex extreme uh, uh, topographies uh, is that we usually used to see them on a map, so on a flat surface, but then uh, uh, they're actually about uh, their three-dimensional shape. So again, this is like an image of uh, 3D maps uh, that the military used to build uh, with a sort of like uh, analog uh, CNC machines. Uh, and we try to do the same, but like with updated technologies. So we, we kind of acquired uh, a digital terrain model of the same glacier, also because we wanted to explore all the possible ways to record uh, um, in a digital way a territory, so a terrain. In this case, I think it's particularly interesting because digital terrain models at the high altitudes are basically um, fake landscapes in the sense that uh, this image is composed of two different uh, measurements, so two different sets of data. Every point of this cloud uh, that, is take, that is above 2,000 meters, above sea level, has been taken in summer when there is no ice and no snow, so you can actually see the land while every point below 2,000 meters is taken in winter when there is like the foliage and the leaves of the, plan of the plants are not there, so you can actually see the land. So the, mo the digital terrain model of the Alps is basically this sort of like uh, imaginary, completely fake landscape that never exists uh, in one single moment in time. Sort of like intermediate passage from which were we, from the digital model, then we built like uh, the real one, so it was a digitally carved uh, a uh, piece of chalk that we see in exhibition that was used then uh, for projection mapping, um, a series of maps uh, and a different visualization of how this border moves uh, on, on an actual three-dimensional model. 
And these, in the end, are images of the final installation, so that's the final drawing machine. The machine in the original exhibitions was connected to the sensors, so this, to the same server where the sensors were broadcasting their data. Every hour downloading the updated data and being able to draw on a map the most updated line of the border, the most updated position of the sensors and the, and the border itself. Uh, then the machine timestamps the maps as a sort of uh, um, attempt of creating every time the most updated and, let's say, the real official map of the border, which uh, the ones that just uh, uh, traced uh, a minute before is already old, is already updated because somehow the glacier moved, even if uh, in an imperceptible way. And that's like uh, just an overview of the, the old uh, installation, which you will see again in the museum. So um, that's it.